But let's bring on now to our guest speaker tonight, um, Graham Atkins. I have had the pleasure of, of um, spending um, a couple of hours sitting in Graham's company, drinking copious amount of beer, which is actually wonderful. Um, he is a man of, of many great talents. And one of them um, is that he controlled a group of people at the cross when you started talking about um, UCU and what is actually going on in the universities and certainly in Chester University. And that's when I got the idea that this uh, gentleman might come along and tell us these problems of what's going on in universities, especially when we hear that there are goodness knows how many um, hundreds of academics now who are very, very angry about the sacking of, of an academic in, in Bristol and the lies which were actually told about him which got his sacking. I don't want to go into it because it, it, it's very convoluting. But I wonder if anything like that's happening with Graham. I know that they might have some good stories. And so I'm gonna hand straight over to Graham now and say, thank you for turning up Graham. And if everybody else could mute, that would be fantastic. Over to you, Graham. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Thanks for inviting me to talk here. And, um... And also thanks for that introduction and that preamble where, where you know, the, the, the water, I was just going on about how the water companies really need to be renationalized. Um, okay, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about higher education and the university sector. And Dave's asked me to talk about the challenges that the higher education university sector is facing at the moment. And uh, so I, I'm going to attempt to give you a bit of an overview uh, informed by my involvement here at the University of Chester. And then I'll talk a little bit about the specific experience of the redundancy process that we went through recently. Um, I joined the union as soon as I started working as a lecturer in my 20s. That's quite a number of years ago now. And it was NAPFI in those days. And there was a very clear division between those teaching at the old universities and those teaching at polytechnics <clears throat> and institutes of and colleges of higher education. I was quite a, an active member, um, not overactive, but you know, I was involved uh, for many years as a union member, but only really uh, in attending meetings voting for industrial action and joining picket lines when we were taking action normally over pay. It wasn't until 2018 that I joined the committee at Chester UCU, as I was feeling increasingly concerned about the direction of travel, both in the sector and uh, as a whole, and, and at University of Chester. Particularly, it used to be when I first started there, it was Chester College of Higher Education. Then it was University College Chester. And now it's, of course, the University of Chester. Um, and I saw a great many colleagues when I was getting involved and, and deciding to get involved with the committee at, at UCU at Chester. I was seeing a great many colleagues who were fearful of more active union engagement and, and involvement and, and of putting their head above the parapet. So. I thought I'd put stick mine up there. So I give this talk in the aftermath of an aggressively promulgated uh, redundancy process by the new vice chancellor and senior management team at the University of Chester. And some of you may have followed this and be aware of the threat of redundancy letters, for instance, that were emailed to staff at 5.20 p.m. on Maundy Thursday just before the long week, Easter weekend. So just think about that, 5.20 p.m. on the Monday Thursday, as we were going into this long Easter weekend, people were getting those emails, telling them that their job was, that their post was at uh, risk of redundancy. Through collective action and protest, we finally, at the beginning of September, 
because those letters are the, yeah so they were coming out Monday Thursday that that was the 31st of uh that's the 1st of April actually when they when they were coming out in the uh in, in, through the email so it wasn't until the beginning of September that we were able to announce that the university had taken the threat of compulsory redundancies off the table and while in some ways this may be seen as a great victory for our union branch there are also ways in which it feels like a somewhat hollow victory. The general public outside the sector perhaps don't give much thought to what's going on in our universities beyond a few throwaway remarks about Mickey Mouse degrees and the size of student debt. But there have been seismic shifts in the sector recently, particularly since Conservatives came to power. I apologise if I'm giving any information here that's obvious uh, to you and you know all about it already, especially someone like Marios, but it's always hard to know from within a sector how much people outside it know about it. So here at Chester, we're a post-1992 institution. And that's one that was formerly a polytechnic or college of higher education. It was a conservative government's decision to bring about this change even though as an exercise in democratization, it appears to be at odds with the increasing level of inequality that Thatcherism was driving forward. And it appears that many Tories never accepted this rebalancing of the status quo, preferring to keep university education restricted to an old school network of the elitist groups that they knew and trusted. They were frustrated by the initial success of Tony Blair's laudable, if arbitrary, aim of getting 50% of school leavers into university. While many universities were expanding, um, investing in staff and facilities and doing heavy lifting on inclusion and widening access to HE, this group of frustrated Tories <laughs> were sniping away in the background about worthless degrees, media and tourism studies that were generally in the firing line, and an unproved, unquantified lowering of standards. The introduction of tuition fees was a godsend to this group as it allowed them to present university education as a simple money equation, value for money or not. Delivered cost effectively or not. A customer transaction measured by league tables and popularity charts. So fast forward from there to 2010 and the barely legitimate coalition government. Within six months of them coming to power, there were student protests that were aggressively policed with kettling leading to violent confrontations. David Cameron controlled much of the narrative about what was happening here and students were demonised as violent and irresponsible. Through criminal sentences and expulsions from universities, a clear message was sent to future students. Suck up the £9,000 fees and don't make a fuss. And quite a lot of students were, were thrown off their courses who, who were involved with those protests, thrown out of universities and given criminal sentences, uh, given, given a criminal record. Michael Gove, lovely Michael Gove, was now education minister and was reshaping the education system into something that more closely matched the traditional elitist system known and loved by the old school conservatives, with an emphasis on final exams at GCSE and A-level, teaching Byron, Keats, Austin and Dickens, a drive to and nothing against them at all <laughs> but uh you know it's this kind of a sweeping away of anything else which was uh, at all different modern or lacking in that sense of tradition that they that they claim all the time these old school conservatives a drive then to push state school pupils towards stem subjects that science technology engineering and um, maths so state schools pupils are definitely being um, encouraged more into STEM subjects. This was an inherent part of the Govian strategy. 
And this is evidenced by an 18% drop in humanities degrees that have been started from the academic year 2009-10, when 234,380 students were enrolled, to 2019-20, when the figure had dropped by 42,000 to 192,000. So for a drop of 42,000 um, starting humanities degrees in a decade. It's a favourite conservative theme that arts, humanities and social sciences, AHSS is the abbreviation commonly used. So uh, arts, humanities and social sciences skills, according to the a lot of conservative commentators are significantly less important than STEM subjects and the skills they bring. But this has been a building argument from them for over a decade or more, supported by the, the loyal press. They've succeeded in moving the conversation to a point where the hugely patronising Fatima's next career is in cyber adverts are considered acceptable. And Gavin Williamson, uh, I was waiting for hisses and things, but um, Gavin Williamson, the education secretary then, can say, as he did in May of this year, that an increase in numbers of students studying STEM subjects shows that they are, quote, starting to pivot away from dead end courses that leave young people with nothing but debt. That's Gavin Williamson with a sweeping comment about presumably all AHSS, arts, humanities and social sciences subjects, these dead end courses leaving people with nothing but debt. The British Academy has done a lot of significant research on this that challenges the government's discrediting of AHSS, arts, humanities and social sciences subjects, showing how crucial they are to major parts of the UK economy how employable, flexible and resilient arts and humanities and social science graduates are and how assessments of potential learning are either erroneous or used erroneously to deter students and their parents and teachers from opting for the, the subject areas. But don't imagine that the arts and humanities are being universally put into managed decline, which I think is what's happening at some institutions because PPE, politics, pol philosophy, and economics will still be taught at Oxford. And the number of applicants from fee-paying schools to English and history degrees at the most selective universities has not declined, but HE has become a marketplace and it's following a business model. It's become a competition for students, research funding, and ratings. And the sector was hurtling headlong towards this commercial model with tuition fees increased to £9,000 per annum, Vice-Chancellor salaries rising exponentially and huge business tie-ins with enterprises like Turnitin becoming widespread. When George Osborne announced the end of the cap on university places in 2015, this cap was an upper limit that was set for each institution that allowed for um, sensible planning and allocation of resources. You know, it, it worked very well uh, for, for the university sector, a bit like the Milk Marketing Board worked very well, you know, in, in terms of planning what you're doing in a particular area. When record numbers of students were accepted at universities that summer, after the cap was removed. University Minister Joe Johnson, remember him? Joe Johnson claimed it was great news and showed that lifting the cap was, quote, helping more people than ever benefit from higher education and gain the skills that businesses seek to boost productivity and support growth. Well, I don't think the Conservative Party should be called the Conservative Party because they conserve nothing except their own wealth. They also seem to be unable to model or plan for the outcomes that are likely as a result of their ideologically driven policies. 
or they do model and plan the outcomes and they achieve and the outcomes they achieve are their exact intentions. So let's fast forward five years and see what the removal of the numbers cap and the drive to steer state school pupils towards STEM subjects has resulted in. Oh, and we of course have Brexit and we have a pandemic. So no more EU students, no Erasmus program. The, this is drying up now and we're feeling the impact already and this will, will get worse. The Erasmus program, which is a brilliant program, uh, European wide program named after the wonderful Renaissance scholar from Holland. Um, that's been replaced by something the Tories, I think they're calling it the Turing program, but it's 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 not going to um, provide our students with opportunities and it won't provide European students with opportunities to come here, I don't think. So foreign student numbers are in steep decline. We've culture wars fermented by a small number of very noisy commentators and then repeated endlessly in the right wing press and on social media. So unsurprisingly, we have huge imbalances in the sector now. Oxford, Cambridge and the Russell Group universities have been hoovering up huge numbers of students, leaving other institutions fighting over crumbs. Institutions that were heavily reliant on, e on the EU or students from other parts of the world, particularly China, have added to this inelegant scramble to get students in by trying to attract more UK students to fill the empty places. Staffing at universities has hit a critical imbalance also. While lecturer play, pay has declined in real terms in the decade between 2010 and 2020 by a hefty 20%. That's a, in, in effect one day a week that people are working for, for free compared to what they were doing in 2010. Um, VCs though, vice chancellors, have who, who run the universities, they are the, the heads of the universities, vice chancellors, chancellors are a sort of um, just an honorary post. We have Giles Brandreth here in Chester as our chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but vice chancellors who get paid uh, have seen eye-watering increases in their salaries, with at least half a dozen vice chancellors earning over half a million pounds a year. Half a million pounds a year, uh, half a million VCs around the country earning that. And v vice chancellor pay is typically about 15 times the median UK income. So there's been some local murmuring um, about the Chester's, about our Chester's vice chancellor earning over £280,000 and benefiting also from an expensively refurbished flat on campus that she was renting for less than students were paying for their tiny little rooms. <laughs> but looking at that in the context of Alice Gast, for example, at Imperial College, who earns £527,400 per year and enjoyed accommodation benefits of £118,000 per annum, then we can see that our poor VC is a relative pauper. Alice Gast, by the way, um, the Imperial College Vice Chancellor, has also admitted to bullying colleagues and did take a pay cut during the pandemic, but this has uh, risen again. I won't bring in any other comments about bullying colleagues. I'll just leave that sort of implied. Right, it's difficult to find accurate statistics about the increasing levels of Vice-Chancellor pay. The Office for Students documents that are held in the House of Commons Library seem to be deliberately obfuscate the matter. Also, because there's a relatively small number of positions uh, counted and the pay variations are enormous, working out mean and median can produce confusing statistics. But it seems fair to say that when the, conservative, when the Conservatives came to power in 2010, 
VC, Vice Chancellor Pay in the previous year was on average around £200,000. And in 2020-21, we are looking at our Chester VC's pay being typical and probably about average in the £280,000 range. So that's a 40% increase in a, in a decade on average, I reckon. And have lecturers' salaries increased by a similar amount? No, well, I, as I just told you, they've declined in real terms by 20%. So the UCU estimates university lecturer pay has declined in real terms by 20% over that same period, over that decade, 2010 to 2020, 21. Pay freezes, 1% pay rises, when rises have occurred, um, allied with inflation, have resulted in a real-term significant loss of earnings. At the same time, casualization has become rife. As student numbers fluctuate because of the removal of the cap, managers seek ever more flexible um, staffing arrangements, resulting in much teaching staff being delivered by hourly paid staff, visiting lecturers, people on, on um, temporary contracts. Good when it's experience for early career PhD students, but unsatisfactory, not just for staff, but especially for students when it becomes the norm. So how is this level of VC pay, Vice Chancellor pay justified? How is it calculated even? Marginal product theory suggests that pay reflects the executive's marginal revenue, but this would assume that the firm's objective is to maximize profit. In the UK higher education, this should not be the case. We shouldn't be trying to just maximize profit because universities are publicly funded bodies, not businesses. So are vice chancellors paid on a performance basis? As the Office for Students, which is the body created by the Conservatives to replace HEFKI, which is the Higher Education Funding Council for England. So the Office for Students has replaced that and they regularly publish performance tables based on crude measurements of student satisfaction, earnings potential for, for graduates, uh, teaching standards, which is done without even inspecting teaching. Um, and you won't imagine, and a number of other uh, measurements, one might imagine that VCs could be liable to snap sackings in a similar way to premiership football managers. You know, if they're not providing, producing the results, then we perhaps need a new manager. This never seems to be the case though with VCs who stay in the post, in their post in the teeth of often fierce controversies, like the bullying one mentioned earlier and obvious evidence of management failure, such as Reading University's 27 million pound joint venture loss. So if VCs are doing a great job and all is well in the university sector, can we look to society and see that our economy is healthy, productivity is high, the health and well-being of our population is sound, and our arts and culture sectors are thriving as a result of having the trained, educated graduate staff required? No, we obviously can't. We're desperately short of doctors and nurses and teachers. Our economy and productivity levels are grinding to a halt. Our vibrant art sector is having to do it all by itself with desperate cuts. And as the Sutton Trust has pointed out, social mobility is shockingly limited. I'm talking to the Labour Party um, here so I do not need to worry, I don't think, about making a political critique of what I see happening in the sector I work in, although a bit of it's kind of slipped in there, hasn't it? Um, but I don't want anyone to take this as this talk as just being some partisan Tory bashing. I actually think over the last three decades, a number of political decisions have been made primarily by the Conservative Party, that are leading our universities in a particular direction. Join the dots is a phrase I've got very fond of recently. <laughs> Join the dots. Some of these decisions 
do not appear to be legislation directly for universities, but they do have a direct impact on our sector. Look at the way the 2014 trade union bill has limited our ability to organize our members, frightening many of them away from any form of collective activism. Look at how the election bill will further limit our campaign campaigning by double counting any money spent on activities that could look like political campaigning. Look at how the police and criminal, sorry, the police and crime bill limits our right to protest. And then look at the legislation that openly targets universities, the way that the free speech bill will be anything but that. It won't be about free speech. It will be about potentially actively encouraging hate speech on our campuses. At the very least, it will again be a cudgel to frighten many into silence. Alongside this, the direction of travel in the sector is to return it towards the old two-tier system. A two-tier system where the privately educated and those bright grammar school children the Conservatives eulogise about and seem to think exist in vast numbers are able to attend elite universities where they can study the arts or medicine, archaeology or ballet or whatever else they wish. Comprehensive school children at least those who don't have to be zero hours Amazon fodder, will be channeled into the vocational courses with less social mobility, such as health and social care and policing, for example. These courses exist in higher numbers at post-92 institutions. They will have to pay the same in course fees, but they will be taught by casualized staff and will graduate with high levels of debt and more limited earning capacity and more limited career flexibility. It might have been better for them to do media studies after all. Management decision-making has become opaque, more so than I can remember it being in, in the past of our institution, certainly. And I hear the same from colleagues at other institutions also. And, and, and I've been talking to a lot of people at other institutions since I've been getting more involved with the union as you'd probably uh, understand uh, because this is the, these attacks that happened here at Chester are not uh, just happening here they're happening across the country so there's an antagonistic stance of directives rather than consultation from the management that's become the norm these kind of directives that is coming out with with no consultation is that, that there's no respect really it seems for, for the academic staff and their views on things we might have some views on how things could be changed, um, which will be obviously thinking about the student experience, which management do say they care about, even if they don't care much about the staff experience. The um, senior management talent pool is often determined by institutions use of a recruitment consultancy that's, that has the ex-minister Virginia Bottomley as a director. That's Odgers Bernson. So yeah, we can try and look more into that, but join the dots, join the dots. What's going on? So having looked at the wider picture in higher education today, which I hope people can discuss further later this evening, um, I would like to just look at briefly at the specific redundancy situation we faced here at Chester, just say a little bit about it, and, um, and our ongoing struggle to retain our university's core values and message, which is summed up really in the, the Latin motto that we have at the university, Key Docet in Doctrina, which we could translate loosely as let the teacher teach, let the teacher teach. We believe our university's goals are educational, not commercial, or should be. We are motivated by excellence in scholarship and pedagogy, not financial gain. Now, some of you will know about our redundancy experience, maybe a little bit about our redundancy experience this year. I found it extremely painful as, um, as being part of the union executive. 
I was part of the consultation process long before at-risk colleagues had any inkling of what was what was um, looming before you know what was coming up for them so I had to watch them kind of um, but but we weren't allowed to tell those of us who were part of the consultation and and knew what was coming weren't allowed to say anything because the university's insistence in confidentiality and 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 keeping everything quiet uh got got quite threatening to be honest and um so we knew that was being used as a, as a trip hazard. We, we, so we had to be very careful not to divulge information that we were, was being told to us. Um, and, and basically watch colleagues kind of walking into uh, a situation where they get a letter at 5.20 on Maundy Thursday and it ruins their um, Easter weekend and they've got nowhere to turn to except their union colleagues to support them and, and guide them and help them. So I think the university's insistence on confidentiality and the way they managed that went beyond the point that was necessary. And it certainly, um, there are many commercial organizations that handled these redundancy processes better than the University of Chester, which is meant to be based on a, a Christian ethos, um, managed this process. It actually seemed quite, um, designed to make people ill and and to make them want to leave the university i think some of the ways they they proceeded so not only the timing of sending out that letter but some of the uh, ways then the whole process was uh, was managed and um just as an indication of that i've got a, a just a quotation i won't give any names but a quotation from a member of the union who was writing after the process, after having gone through this redundancy process and didn't lose their particular job, um, but found the whole process made them quite unwell and certainly wasn't, didn't seem to be in keeping with the university's staff wellbeing proclamations and the fact that they supposedly care about that. Here's a quotation from this member. I spoke about certain actions and communications from people in management positions this is consultation with the HR later. And the tone of hostility and contempt being set by people in positions of power when dealing with people whose livelihoods are in their hands. So that's just one little glimpse of the kind of impact of the whole process on, on individuals. Um, because the 86 jobs that they were going for, which were identified in the section 188, it's, which is, uh, issued to the which, which is why the trade union has to get involved by law when they're trying to get rid of over 20 posts the 86 posts that they went for um is only really the headline number they were writing lots of letters to many more people than that who were on at-risk lists in the pools from which they select those in danger of redundancy i'm sure people will have an, an understanding of the redundancy processes of, from other sectors of work um, so I know this isn't a unique situation but I think the university handled it very um, poorly so part of our fight uh, against these redundancies that were planned um, was to well it was successful basically I think in that we did um, mitigate and reduce the number of redundancies and we but we still had several colleagues at risk right through to the to that point in September when finally um, it was announced that they weren't going to seek any compulsory redundancies. Um, we know though we knew that this was likely to just be one skirmish in an ongoing attack on staff numbers and working conditions replacing permanent contracts with casual hourly paid staff is a growing menace and they seem to be in in certain areas you know engaging in this kind of uh firing and rehiring sort of uh, behavior and under cover of covid business plans were launched were launched at this university um and across the country which uh, seemed to be echoing government policy so we fought for these posts and we managed to avoid any compulsory redundancies but we did lose people, of course, through voluntary severance 
and a lot of people also moving on from the university which they felt had become hostile and just heard today about another uh, professor who has moved on to a, a, a job at the University of Aberdeen leaving Chester behind even though his his job was was saved so the immediate threat of redundancy has, has passed and we're feeling phew that was over but we have lost a lot of valued colleagues to voluntary severance and people moving on and sadly we've had to enter then into a national now dispute over pay and over other what, what's called the four fights um, which are over issues of um, gender ethnic and disability pay gap and that's one of the fights there's an end to contract casualization and rising job insecurity that's the second strand of the four fights to tackle rising workloads driving our members to breaking point that's the third strand and finally about pay itself and as i said that in effect 20 percent cut that has happened over the last decade so there's a demand the union are making nationally to increase the space pay spine uh, all spine points on the national pay scale so that's something that we're now voting on and it's uh, the, the the ballot's about to close uh, on the 4th of november so we've been desperately trying to get everyone to get their votes out and um, as we know with the trade union legislation it's it's not easy to meet the criteria now for a successful ballot you've got to get at least 50 percent turnout all the posts have to be done done by posts you know physical posts no email voting or anything like that so i hope we will get the necessary turnout and um, and that we'll vote yes to strike action and action short of a strike that's what the union leadership and committee have been encouraging our members to do but we'll see what happens next so just to reiterate to finish then um our ongoing struggle is to retain the university's core values and and uh, there's a feeling that there are forces at work that don't really share those the values that me and my colleagues have which is you know, let the teacher teach, credo set in doctrina. We believe our university's goals are educational, not commercial. We're motivated by excellence in scholarship and pedagogy, not financial gain. In my department at the University of Chester, which is the English department, we take great pride in leading students from non-traditional university backgrounds through their, um, through their undergraduate journey and we rejoice in seeing them take up a wide range of careers, particularly teaching, where so many of our students excel in passing on the passion, enthusiasm and skills they've developed in studying the specialist subject areas they love. There are few staff rooms in Chester schools that have no graduates, no graduates from the University of Chester. So let the teacher teach and uh, let's hope our uh, fight to retain our university and its, its core values can be successful. Thanks, Dave, for inviting me to speak. I hope that's um, been of some interest to you. I think it's been a little bit more than interest, Graham. It's, it's quite a frightening picture that you're painting in some ways. Um, and, and, it, and it's very sad that it, it, it's coming to this. There. I, I always believed when I went into education, you were there for the, for the students. Obviously, I'm naive. Everybody else seems to be naive. And uh, it's there for profit because that is the Tory mantra. So what I'm going to do now, if it's all right with yourself, Graham, is I would very much like questions from everyone else if they've got anything to ask you. And the way to ask a question is please put up your hand in the uh, participant box and I will take them one at a time, whoever gets there first. And of course, there's no one wants to ask a question as yet. No one whatsoever. Oh dear. Oh dear. Still waiting for a question. Yes, I've got Marios who's got a question. Marios. If you could actually unmute yourself and, and if you possibly can put put your, uh, your 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 video camera on, that'd be great. Your question to Graham. 
Hey, Graham. Can you see and hear me? Yeah. Um, what role, if any, in this um, process at Chester has the governing council taken? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question because if you start to... With Chester, by the way. Sorry? He's, which is chaired for the benefit of everyone else, chaired by the Bishop of Chester, his reverence. Well, I think it's uh, Canon Turnbull, who's the chair of the governors, yeah. Who's, I don't know if he's the actual bishop, is he? Um, but, yeah, I think the, the role of the governors was one of supporting the vice chancellor, basically. And, and in spite of all the um, representations that people felt they, they, they needed to send to the governors, uh, obviously the union would, would send a few things through to the governors that we were trying to raise, uh, raise issues about financial mismanagement and other things. But, um, but even um, independent letters from independent bodies were, were treated very, and, and even from students were treated very um, dismissively, I'd say, and a very disappointing response from um, the governors to some student inquiries about what was, was going on, student objections, and basically just supporting the vice chancellor and, and any decision she was making. But I, I think it, 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 it's, you know, it's a good question, Marius, because as you know, that's the only real way to uh, of bringing the vice chancellors to account is, is to try to to approach the governors and yeah. to make the governors see that the that the that, that, that a lot of these vice chancellors are getting, you know, uh, that they're bringing the reputation of, of of places into. I'm not commenting here specifically about Chester. I hasten to add. Because I don't want to make that accusation, but you know, vice chancellors are bringing universities into disrepute, and they need yeah. to be held to account. They, the they, that is through the government. Sorry, Marius, go on. More time massaging the uh, the government, the governing, because the only, the, as you as you say quite rightly, I mean these days because things like senates have been stripped of their power. The only um, check on vice chancellor's power is in the, uh, the governing council, and they're very varied in membership. Um, and Chester's traditionally has had quite a strong um, lay, I mean, i.e., non-academic and religious um, membership, which you would imagine would have been uh, questioning um, decisions like this. So I wonder how they managed to. Um, I, th I think they may have blindsided the council initially and then felt necessary felt it necessary because they'd only appointed Eunice Simmons when two years earlier yeah I think you came in 2020 yeah yeah um beginning of that yeah so they uh, who had no experience in, in in managing an entire institution before she appointed I think um the the bishop that you've mentioned Mark Tanner is that's a sort of titular role and yeah. that uh, Canon Turnbull was the chair of the governors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I met a, I met the, the I met one of the governors just last week uh, who's got a background in Costco. So I mean, I don't know whether that's um. What, well, the only local that's a business. That's a business. Yeah. Can we move on to the next question, if you don't mind, Marius? Okay, go All right. Ahead. You you got three goes at that. That was great. <laughs> Thanks for the answer there, um, Linda. Linda, you've got a question for for Graham. Hi, um, I can see that the, the, the levels of pay for vice chancellors and the casual contracts for lecturers are, are concerning and, and wrong. Um, and it's really interesting being uh, that being brought to our awareness. But I really object to you describing STEM subjects and um, vocationally focused subjects as, as being second class in some way or, or inferior to other subjects. I think, I think that's um, a misrepresentation. And people value their work and their careers in ways other than financial. So a lot of people might be working in health or social care or education um, and love what they're doing. Um, and so it's, it's unfair, I think, to, to downgrade these. 
Oh, well, I didn't. I, well, I didn't mean to downgrade them, and I didn't mean to imply that they were inferior at all. I was merely trying to defend the areas of in which I work more directly, the arts and humanities, against attacks on those areas, and a suggestion that they are inferior. I don't think that science, technology, engineering, maths are inferior in any way. Um, but I do think there's an increasing sense that arts and humanities subject areas are inferior. That was my that was my point. Okay, it was just you said like state school students are pushed to STEM subjects, not getting the choices. Um, the well, I do think yeah, I do think that I do think that's happening. That which I don't, which is not saying that those subjects are inferior, but that it's a shame that. Um, all students should be pushed in that direction when many might want to be studying history or geography at, at degree level. That was my point. Okay, is that all right, Linda? Maybe for another time. I want to go on to um, uh, Matthew Carter. Um, I, I believe that um, Matt was uh, a graduate at Chester University. Matt? Um, I was at Bangor Uni. My, um, oh, you're at Bangor, sorry. Yeah. Um, my question was on sort of following on from Marius is how would you, in your sort of ideal scenario, how would you keep in check the vice chancellors of universities on their um, pay and spends? Our, our vice chancellor ended up early retiring because he'd spent three quarters of a million pound, um, one buying a house that the uni then owned, and then um, a quarter of a million renovating it with 700 pounds cushions um 95,000 pounds on a bathroom and a kitchen refit um uh there's been the case you'll probably have seen in um manchester where the vice chancellor has basically dismissed the concerns for an entire year of the students trapped in their uni accommodation I'm just wondering how you would curtail the vice chancellor's sort of authority yeah I, I, it's a really good question matthew i i think a strong union is is important strong a strong ucu um nationally and and locally is going to be very important in in pushing back against this um against these vice chancellors who are very highly paid and seem to be a bit out of control if you want my opinion um and marius has raised the question of the governors um and i think it's going to be increasingly important that we bring pressure to bear on governors to uh, rein in these excesses because i think the the, the amounts of money we're talking um and and the levels of um well, uh, I, I think I have to be careful with my words here, but some of the behaviour um, from the vice chancellors does seem to be um, difficult to defend, and um, I'm not quite sure how they're 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 getting away with it. But I, th I suppose there's a government um, there's a government role here, isn't there? Really, there's a need for leadership from from our from our government on this and to sort out the sector by by reining in these uh, massively overpaid vice chancellors who are often getting engaged in vanity projects and seem to be behaving with, with quite a lot of hostility to, towards their staff. That's cool. Thank you, Graham. Uh, we've got a question now from uh, Ray, Ray McHale. Hi, Graham. Hi, Ray. It, it wasn't particularly a question, but it was just uh, just some comments really to say that you know, I thought it was that, you know, really good that the UCU did get so organised over this redundancy issue uh, in Chester. Um, obviously, um, my, my union Unison is also involved at the college and uh, you know, I, I find it quite hard um, about their almost softly, softly approach to everything um, in terms of negotiating for their members, because obviously Unison members were, were part of the redundancy threat and, and 
you know, there still seems to be threats of redundancies at, at Padgate campus with the, with the closure of the accommodation there. So the, the support staff, you know, doing meals and cleaning, et cetera, they face potentially losing their, their jobs. And universities obviously single table bargaining now. So it's, it's in effect, all unions together uh, negotiating over you know all, all issues really but you know historically what we see is that you see you are fairly quick to respond and ballot their members and quite often unison nationally you'll be a, two months behind before they, they are thinking about balloting their members on the mm -hmm. same issues so you don't get the unity of action that is necessary. I mean, even over this redundancy issue, I I, I put something on the as a, a unison at Chester University Facebook page now, which shows I get a little bit more organised. I put something on there about the vice chancellor's flat and how she was getting a better deal for her rent than the students were, uh, and. The full-time officers from Manchester decided to remove it because they thought it was too uh, uh, over the top to have a go at the vice chancellor, which I think is you know, it's really pathetic for a trade union to uh, you know fail to uh, make whatever it can in support of its members in in, in arguing for these things. So, and you know, there are quite a lot of issues. That there's been issues with the cleaning staff, the university trying to move them to a split shift shift system. Uh, which has been going on for a couple of years, but you know, again, my union, my union branch don't even publicise those issues uh, amongst their own members, let alone do any sort of public campaigning on them. So there's there's a lot to be done in trying to uh, get get everyone organised and doing as well as the UCU. And you know, I think there are some Unite members at the university based in the grounds maintenance maintenance department and that but I, I remember trying to find out when we've had ballots on pay in the past what branch they come under but I couldn't from the Unite region even find out what branch they belong to so it was really hard to to get any unity in action on some of these things but I, you know I think UCU with the protest with the general secretary coming up for the protest etc uh, have, have done really well in the circumstances and I think yeah, we, we want to build on that. Praise indeed, praise indeed. Thank, thanks, uh, Ray. Does that need an answer, Graham? Well, not really. I'll only just to say, well, thanks for saying that we've done a good job and uh, we have worked hard. But And, and I think Unison, we, we are working, we're trying to work more closely with our Unison colleagues. And I agree, we need to, we need to work together because there is certainly a feeling that there could be lots of Unison jobs at risk. Um, with the vision that, that the, this vice chancellor has for the university, which is a lot more online learning, you know, and um, not the need for I, what I what I think we want is a, a lively campus, you know, with with a lot of Unison members uh, doing the necessary jobs to keep that campus running smoothly and 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 effectively. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens. But we'll certainly be working more with our Unison colleagues, Ray. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. We've got a question now from teacher um, Paul Spencer. Hello there. I am a graduate from uh, Chester University. Um, two things I wanted to like talk about. One, the ethos. I mean, that's been changing for many years since Thatcher's time, when she was cutting back on the funding for universities then and the grant system as we had then. Um, and that would, I would imagine, take a long time to turn around. Um, but the other issue of trying to defend current working conditions and the number of jobs and that. Um, and you mentioned a lot about this governing body. And I just wondered who is on this governing body and how are they appointed? Well, there's a number, yeah, there, there are a number of... Uh people on the governing body and it's sort of changing all, all the time slightly around the edges um, and in fact the new head of HR is now on the governing body so um, it's uh, it's interesting it's an interesting question Paul as to how um, how clear and transparent 
um, these processes are in terms of how the people who get put on these governing bodies are selected. I mentioned that uh, company, Audres Bernson earlier, with which Virginia Bottomley is the chair of. And they seem to be involved in the, quite a number of um, appointments of governors to university governing bodies um, recently. So, and, and vice chancellors as well. So, you know, when you've got these private consultancy firms um, running who that running these appointments and inviting people it's not surprising that you get some political um you, you get some political games going on there if you like um so yeah we we continue to monitor who is on the governing uh, the board of governors and we try to uh, you know keep keep lines of communication open with them and many of them have business backgrounds and uh seem to be bringing, I would say, a political agenda. Was there yeah. a clear constitution as to how that body is constructed and appointed? Uh, yeah, I th there is, a, I believe. Um, yeah, I believe there is part, it's part of the constitution of the university, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Paul. From a, from a current teacher to, uh, to an ex-teacher, Councillor Richards. Hi everyone. Um, I just uh, going on from what Ray was saying about the unions maybe not being as strong as they might be. I mean, my union, the NASUWT, their mantra is always the union is only as strong as its members. And um, I just wondered if the workforce, you know, how many of them, what percentage are in trade unions? Because teachers, universally are in trade unions but an awful lot of them think they're in it because of insurance and when it comes to activism you know collectivism solidarity these words mean nothing to them and trying to get them to act together to protect jobs and conditions is really quite difficult i think ray will understand where i'm coming from because i was from very early days, workplace representative, um, health and safety rep, and then I became the local negotiation secretary. Numbers we had, people supporting action, very low. I remember, I'll give you one example of which might illustrate what I mean. This lady, and she called herself a lady, uh, approached me to help her with a workplace problem. And the first thing she said to me was, Oh, I've never spoken to a union person before. And I thought, I, I, you know, I've got no chance. So how many university lecturers, you know, are, are actually in trade unions and active members? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's, that's a very good question. I think there are a lot of people who do join the union as a, a sort of insurance policy, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And they will turn to the union at, at times when they need help, but they're not really seeing themselves as part of the union who need to be active in support of others. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we have found that the that the experience we've been through this year has um, we, we've we've grown in our membership. And I would say we've got about, you know, we, we've I think it's about 60 percent uh, membership across the academic staff at the university which isn't too bad but it could obviously be improved we'd like to improve it and we're trying to get more and more reps in different departments so um you know one area which is um you know causing us a lot of concern at the moment is, is in health and, and social care uh, a big department with a lot of uh, which is such so, so desperately important the, the the work done in in that department in that faculty um, but I think a lot of staff are feeling quite um, overworked. The, the workload levels are very high for them. And, um, but I think there's a certain fear as well of stepping forward and getting involved with the union and becoming a rep, which, which of course takes a lot of time. It takes, a, I've, I've spent so many hours of my time now involved with the union um, matters over the last few months. And it's really not recognised. I know there is, those of you who know union work will know about facilities time. 
and you you have a certain amount of time that you you meant to have for your officers that's that's really built in and, and is meaningful but we've been finding it's not really that meaningful you know um and we need to make the uh management take facilities time more seriously but this needs a strong national union um to to, to drive things like that and we need to show that we have got a lot of support from our membership like you're saying Trish it's really important um, so we've been doing a lot of work to try to uh, reach out to members and show that we're we're there we're there for them when they need us so we hope that they will get more involved and active yeah yeah, I, just, yeah I think the the damage done I mean we've had a long talk about Thatcher on this uh, on for the many Mondays and there's that legacy of union, you know, um, well, we, you know, they're activists, they're, they're, they're not people to be trusted, almost. And I think we've got to get over that and see, you know, I don't know how, but there's still that legacy of unions are dangerous. And I certainly think that a lot of people have been, um, well, let's say, not very well liked by management because they're active in union activities and people are bound to be worried so i don't yeah, know, how to put I, know. I, I think it's a real shame because i've been trying to make i think that management have to see that un, strong health strong unions are healthy for the institution yeah. because we've done a lot of work we've done a lot of work to to help um staff through this process more work than the management, to be honest, you know, in terms of real care for the for the members who are affected. Not that I don't mean just you to you members, but staff who are affected um, by what they're going through. And they've got nowhere else to turn but to the union. So um, I think we should be proud of how we've uh, we, we've provided loads and loads of support. You know, we've provided a rep for every person, every member who was at risk to go to attend interviews with them you know, consultation meetings that they have to go through as part of the process. So I think people do see uh, coming out of that, that the union isn't just about um, some, you know, ra radical politics on uh, that's, uh, that's, that's stuck back in the time of anti-Thatcher. It's uh, relevant now to what they're going through and in supporting them. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Graham. And thanks, Trish, for that question. Um, if anybody's interested, there's a couple of really good comments on, on the chat. Uh, one from Marius, which is quite interesting. I, I obviously realise how difficult it must be with dealing with your governors when I found out that the only local um, councillor is Razor Daniels. Um, you've got your work cut out there. Um, yeah, unless there's a... A photographer there. That's what I've been told. She's very, very, very good at. Um, we've also got another comment on here, which is the final question of, of the of the evening to you, Graham. Is that uh, the question is asked by a couple of people? How can we help as Labour members? I can't put my hand down. Well, that's uh, that's yeah. How can you help? Well, I suppose you can just be and you know, take an interest in what's happening at the university and. Obviously, the work that you do by being involved with Labour is is helpful. I'd say in terms of the, I see the, I see the agenda that really that's going on in university is driven by you know conservative government policy, and an, and a hostility to certain subject areas, which encourage critical thinking, for example, and uh, they don't really like the idea. I think of um, um, people from certain backgrounds going on to do degrees in areas which might encourage critical thinking independence and you know um, political activism even possibly so those are the areas in particular that they seem to be attacking social sciences history english um even at the university of chester we have a very uh, vibrant theology department one of the few in the country which also teaches philosophy and all sorts of world religions not just christianity um and that uh, that uh, subject area came under attack even though it is an institution with a with a Christ, uh, history of yeah. association yeah. with the church of england yeah. 
and where the communicate where the vice chancellor is meant to be a communicant member of the of the Church of England as well. So it it, so, it sat rather strangely with those supposed core values of the institution. But what can you do? Yeah, just follow f follow the follow the um follow anything you find in the in the local media. Come out to any other rallies we might have. You know, support us if we're out on the picket line. So there'll soon be a result about this recent ballot. And um, if we're taking action, you know, show your solidarity by even just with messages is, is great. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. And I'm glad I invited you to turn up because I think I, I found it's been an interesting conversation. Um, certainly some of the questions were great and also your views um, thought provoking and uh, I think there is hope there. There's got to be hope. There's got to be hope with the with the younger generation. What's it called? The X generation or the yeah. Y generation or whatever sort of generation. Well, that's something but to end with, Dave, is, yeah, what can you do? Encourage people, if you know their lecturers or teachers, encourage them to get involved with you, with the, become a member of the union and get involved with the union and don't be scared of that. It's empowering and it will it will make them feel more capable of standing up to a reckless management. But also, yes, students, we, we, we want students to be encouraged to be more radical, don't we? And um, it's a real shame. It's a, it was a real shame in this latest process we went through, how the student union seems to have been co-opted by the management. And we really want to encourage more student activism. So, you know, anything anyone can do to encourage young people to be more, you know, uh, politically active, the better, which I'm sure you're all keen to do and get them to join the Labour Party. But yeah. Of course, Graham. Yeah. One of these days we'll get you as a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to hear you, Gray, and I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks. For